I want to talk to you today about giving. My style is to preach through broad sections of the Bible. I'll take maybe a book of the Bible, and I talk about whatever we run into. And today, we uh, encounter a, uh, a passage about David's giving. Uh, this is the 14th message in After God's Heart. God tells us in Acts that David is a man after God's own heart. But we know that David got angry with a man named Nabal who insulted him and he was heading out to kill him and all his men. We know he committed adultery with Bathsheba. To cover it up, he murdered her husband, Uriah. You say, what? How can he be called a person after God's own heart? So obviously, a person after God's own heart, and it's the same for you, doesn't mean that you're perfect. But it means you take your cue from David that you repent quickly when you realize you've done wrong, when God convicts you and you confess it and get back with God. We've also been learning that David focused not on his enemies like Goliath or Saul, but he focused on God and his power. To be a person after God's own heart, you don't focus on your challenges, but on God. Then two weeks ago, Chris uh, talked about how David had a passion for God. He worshiped God like crazy as they're bringing the ark into Jerusalem. He wrote 75 Psalms. They're amazing. He had a tender heart towards God. And then last week, Micah talked about how uh, we pray to God about everything. If you want to be a, a person after God's own heart, David prayed to God about the situations he was facing. Now today we learn that another sign of being a person after God's own heart is shown in our giving. As we're going to see today, David was incredibly generous with God. We need instruction about giving. How many of you feel like you were taught biblical principles of giving by your parents? Raise your hand nice and high so I can see. Okay, like the first service, it's well less than 50% of you. I'm going to go out on a limb here and guess that most of you were not taught biblical principles about money management by your parents either. America is broke. The U.S. government is in debt. 78% of Americans are broke, living paycheck to paycheck. 64% of Americans can't even cover a $1,000 emergency. Bankrate.com reported 28% of Americans do not have a single penny saved. 52% of Americans have less than $10,000 saved for retirement. Clearly, most of us did not get biblical principles of finance from our parents. So today I want to talk to you about giving and money management. Now, I'm not a CPA. I'm not a certified financial planner. I'm making no attempt to be. My expertise is the Bible. And I've made it my practice over the years. Every summer, I go on a thing called study leave. And I make it my practice to take one book with me on biblical principles of financial management. This last summer, I took Smart Money, Smart Kids by Dave Ramsey and his daughter, Rachel Cruz. And then this winter, my daughter Cam and I took Financial Peace University, taught by Dan Sides, who did an amazing job. So the way I want to focus on the message today is, what should parents teach their children about giving and money management? If you have children, what should you tell them? Maybe you're not a parent, but you hope to be a parent someday. What will you teach them? You say, it's too late. My kids are out of the house. Do you have grandchildren? Dave Ramsey says one of the best books a grandparent can teach their grandchildren about money management is the tortoise and the hare. You go like the tortoise, uh, the, 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 slowly. And you, you spend less than you earn every month. And you put some of that away every month. It builds up slowly. If you're a teenager, the time to learn about money is now and about giving. 
You say, I'm not a Christ follower. Well, it turns out God's principles for money management and giving are true for every human on this globe. So let's look at David's giving. We're going to look at 2 Samuel 24. That's on page 327 in our Bibles. And stick your finger also in 1 Chronicles 21, which is on page 418. David goes to Aronah, the Jebusite, to offer a sacrifice to God. Why is he offering a sacrifice? Because he has sinned. He asks his military leaders to count the soldiers in his army. You say, what's wrong with that? God asked Moses to take a census when he brought the people out of Egypt. He asked Moses to take a census before they brought the people into the land of Canaan. The problem here is David's motivation. It's out of pride. When he began as king, he did everything by faith in God. He said, God, help me against Goliath. Help me against the Philistines or the Syrians. Now he's getting proud about his successes militarily, and he wants to count his soldiers. Again, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, Go and take a census of Israel and Judah. The parallel passage in 1 Chronicles, Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census. One says God incited it, one says Satan did. Which is it? Or is this an example of an error in the Bible? Both are true. God wanted to use this to chasten David, get him back to depending on him for his strength. And Satan wanted to use it to humiliate David and to take the lives of many Israelites. So David said to Joab and the commanders of the troops, go and count the Israelites from Beersheba to Dan. Then report back to me so I know how many there are. Joab replied, may the Lord multiply his troops a hundred times over. My Lord, the king, are they not all my Lord's subjects? Why does my Lord want to do this? Why should he bring guilt on Israel? Joab objects. The king's word, however, overruled Joab and the army commanders, so they left the presence of the king to enroll the fighting men of Israel. Joab reported the number of the fighting men to the king. In Israel, there were 800,000 able-bodied men who could handle a sword, and in Judah, 500,000. And in Chronicles, it says, Joab reported the number of fighting men to David. In all Israel, there were 1,100,000 men who could handle a sword, including 470,000 in Judah. Wait a minute. Samuel says there were 800,000 in Israel. Chronicles says there were 1.1 million. Which is it? Or is this an error? Samuel says there were 500,000 in Judah, and, and uh, Chronicles says there were 470,000. Both can be true. We believe this means 800,000 in Israel were battle-tested troops, and 300,000 were military age but reserves. In Israel today, every man, able-bodied man, 45 and under, is part of the military. The majority of them are reservists. They only get called up when there's a problem. As to Judah, we read, but Joab did not include Levi and Benjamin in the numbering because the king's command was repulsive to him. And it could have been that David uh, was convicted by God that he had done wrong. And so uh, Joab started out going down through Hebron and Beersheba and then uh, along the Sinai and then up the coast of the Mediterranean and then up to the Galilee and then down to Jerusalem would be his last place. So the last tri uh, tribe would be Benjamin. And David says, you don't need to count anymore. I did wrong. This might explain why Samuel says 500,000 troops in Judah and Chronicles says only 470,000. David was conscience stricken after he had counted the fighting man, and he said to the Lord, I've sinned greatly. Lord, I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant. I've done a foolish thing. Before David got up the next morning, the word of the Lord had come to Gad, the prophet, David seer. Gad may be the writer of 2 Samuel. Go and tell David, because uh, Samuel has now died, Go and tell David, this is what the Lord says. I'm giving you three options. Choose one of them for me to carry out against you. So Gad went to David and said to him, Shall there come on you three years of famine, or three months of fleeing from your enemies? 
or three days of plague in your land. Think about it. Let me know. David said to Gad, I'm in deep distress. Let us fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercy is great. Don't let me fall into human hands. He says, I don't want to let you, you know, my enemies destroy us. There's no telling what they will do to us. But I know your mercy is great. Let me come under your discipline. So the Lord sent a plague on Israel from that morning until the end of the time designated. 70,000 people of the people from Dan to Beersheba died. The sin was to number the soldiers. The punishment was to reduce the number of soldiers. God tells David to offer a sacrifice to atone for his sin. Aaron now said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? To buy your threshing floor, David answered, so I can build an altar to the Lord that the plague on the people may be stopped. Aaron now said to David, Let my lord the king take whatever he wishes and offer it up. Here are the oxen for the burnt offering. Here are the threshing sledges and the ox yokes for the wood. Your majesty, Aaron gives all this to the king. He also said, May the lord your God except you. He was happy to offer everything, the land, everything. But David says, no, I insist on paying you for it. I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. David says, I'm not going to do that. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen and paid 50 shekels of silver for them. David built an altar to the Lord there and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. He pays full price for the, for the offering. It wants, he, it's going to cost him something so God knows he's serious on wanting getting back to being a person after God's own heart again. Then the Lord answered his prayer in behalf of the land and the plague on Israel was stopped. The parallel in Chronicles is interesting. Then the Lord spoke to the angel and he put his sword back into its sheath. God answers David's prayer and stops the plague. He grants him his blessing once again. Historically, this is a famous site where David makes this sacrifice will be the same site where Solomon will build the temple, a massive temple. The south side of this site is the same place where Jesus will die on the cross as a sacrifice for all sins. David wants to build the temple, but God says, no. You've been a commander of the army. You've shed a lot of blood. Solomon will be the one. But David was able to gather the supplies. So we read in 1 Chronicles 29, 5, or 4, 2, no, verse 2. With all my resources, I provided for the temple, this is David talking, provided for the temple, gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, onks, tur turquoise, stones, all kinds of fine stone, marble, Besides, in my devotion to the temple of my God, I now give my personal treasures of gold and silver over and above everything I have provided for this holy temple. 3,000 talents of gold, 7,000 talents of refined silver. How much was this? Get ready. $870 million. David was the Jeff Bezos of his day. You say, where do you get that kind of money? Well, remember now, David expanded the borders of Israel 10 times under his rule. They defeated all the Philistines who would be along the Mediterranean coast, like the Gaza Strip today. The people to the north, like Lebanon today. The people to the east, like Syria and Jordan. People to the south, like Saudi Arabia and Yemen. And they plundered all their gold and silver. David was a man after God's own heart, and one of the ways he showed it was by giving generously to God. Then David says, now who's willing to consecrate themselves to the Lord today? He's talking to his leaders. Then the leaders of families, officers, commanders, officials in charge of the king's work gave willingly. They gave toward the work on the temple 5,000 talents and 10,000 derricks of gold, 10,000 talents of silver. They gave over a billion dollars. 
You say, why does the Bible tell me how much David gave? Why does it matter? Doesn't Jesus say, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing? Yes, he does. One of the principles of giving is you don't give to impress other people. You give to God. You give secretly. But here we get another principle. When all of Israel is building something together, this massive temple, when the church is doing something together, the leaders step out first, and they give publicly to inspire others to give as well. I tell our board members, I expect them all to tithe. I mean, we can't ask other people to do what, what the staff and elders are not willing to do. I would never do this ordinarily, but as David was public about his giving, I just looked back over our giving the last 10 years and found that we've given 12% every year. Our parents both tithed and they gave beyond the tithe, so it's never been a discussion in our marriage. David was a man after God's own heart and he trusted God with his money and he gave generously to God. God wants us to trust him and give generously to him. So what principles from this text could you teach your children about money management and giving generously to God? One, giving that costs nothing does not bring honor to God. If David would have accepted Arunah's offer, it wouldn't have cost him anything. And it wouldn't have brought honor to God. He wanted to give a gift that cost him something to show God he was truly sorry about his sin. Now, we give our kids jobs around the house and in the yard and then encourage them to give the first tenth of it back to God. When I see some of my kids tithing, I know it honors God because they have huge expenses ahead of them. College, graduate school, maybe they want to buy a car. And so it's costing them something. Rockefeller said, I could not have tithed on the first one million if I had not learned to tithe on my first one dollar and fifty cents. You don't want to try, David didn't try to get a bargain for the land. There are times when hunting for a bargain is bad practice. One time is when it comes to giving to God. When I asked Joy to marry me, I bought her a ring. Now, I didn't have any money. I was a, a seminary student. Every dime I earned went for school. But my parents had taught me not to buy on credit. And so I set aside money for a ring and uh, bought her as nice a ring as I could, I could afford. I wanted to honor her. When we make a sacrifice to give to God, it brings honor to God. Two, giving that costs nothing does not require being smart with money. If you're going to give generously to God like David did, seek to give back to him the first tenth or more of your income, it's going to take planning. People don't give generously just on impulse. They have to think it through and have a budget so they can plan to give. Parents, we should start with our children when they're young, like three to five years old. Don't give them an allowance. Allowance implies that people are incapable. Allowance sounds like welfare. Pay them for small jobs. At that age, maybe it's making their bed, cleaning up their toys, bringing dishes over to the sink, sweeping. And then teach them to give 10% back to God. And then they can spend the rest. You want them to get the concept, when I work, I get paid. When I don't work, I don't get paid. This is a biblical principle. Paul says, if anyone will not work, neither shall they eat. The Bible teaches that work is a good thing. Everybody is to work. It gives us purpose. Now, there's some people that have disabilities, but even with disabilities, we can still do some work. Now, when the kids get 6 to 13... When then we give them bigger jobs and a bigger variety of jobs. And we teach them three envelopes. First, first envelope is give. You give the first 10% to God. Then the second envelope is save. And the third envelope is spend. 
At this age, uh, the save envelope is basically just a, a slow spend. You're saving up to buy something big or bigger. Uh, we teach them that it applies to everything. If they get birthday money or gift money, they give the first 10% to God. They save some and then they spend. We try to pay, pay them fast. If they, if they work, if you can pay them on that day, that's the best. No longer than the end of the week. And you want to give with enthusiasm and say, I'm really proud of the job you did. You want, you want them to be learning pride in their work. When you t continually teach your child proper working, giving, saving, and spending, you're giving them uh, characteristics that they can build into their lives that will give them success in life, how to win in life. There's enormous a sense of accomplishment for a child to walk into a store and throw down on the counter money they earned to buy something. Now, to say that they can spend their spend envelope any way they want does not mean you give up your right to be a parent. Children cannot be allowed to buy things you don't approve of just because they earned it. If you let your kids do whatever they, they want, you're not a parent, you're a zookeeper. <laughs> Obviously, if your teen wants to spend money on cocaine, you don't allow that. Now, when they get to be 14 to 20, same principle, 10% give back to God, save. Now it's getting more serious. Now they're saving for college and graduate school and a car. So that save envelope is, is more, more important. Um, this is when kids start getting letters in the mail for a credit card. I've heard parents have told me, uh, I want to get my kid a, a credit card so they can learn responsibility and get a credit score. I think, what? Are you kidding me? Credit score doesn't tell you anything about how much money, money you have. It only tells you how much debt you have and that you pay it on time. Visa, MasterCard, Discover, and American Express spent $4 billion a year ago to get you to use their credit cards. You have to prepare your kids for the lies. I don't know anyone who would come right out and say, oh, I love being in debt. I love paying $10,000 a year to the bank. Come on, you'd have to be nuts. But what about these common lies? I'll always have a car payment. Of course you need a mortgage to buy a house. Student loans are good debt. I guarantee you, your child will hear these lies. Debt is not a good thing. We want to be teaching our children to do everything they can to avoid debt. Um, Solomon says, the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. A slave can't go where he wants. He has to do what his master tells him to do. That's why they call it MasterCard. <laughs> when you teach your kids to use plastic, you're teaching them they don't have to delay gratification and save up and pay cash for things. If you go into the, one of the worst things you can do is when you go into a store and your kid says, I want that, and you throw it on your credit card. They're not learning anything about work anything about giving, anything about saving, anything about spending. You should say, okay, well, let's go to work for that. We'll pay you, and you can save up and buy it. So let's talk about two of the lies. I'll always have a car payment. Young people make this mistake all the time. They get a new job. They celebrate their $400 raise with a $500 car payment. Got to have a new car, right? If they get a new car every five years, how much do you think 40 years of car payments will cost them? The average car payment is $492 a month. If they learn early to save up and pay cash for cars, they won't have those payments. If they would invest $492 a month 
into a growth stock mutual fund, say 10 to 12 percent, between age 25 and 65, guess how much money they would have? $5,846,000. That's the opportunity cost when you don't think through taking out a loan. Now, some of you, you know, you're smart and you're thinking in your mind, oh, wait a minute, if you're going to save up and pay cash for a car, you'd be putting that 492 in a car savings fund. You wouldn't have it to put it in the growth stock fund. And where are you going to find 10 to 12% interest today? Don't, get, don't miss the big point and get, by getting stuck in the weeds. The big point is God teaches in his word that we're not to pay interest, we're to earn interest. We save up to pay cash for things. Second, another uh, lie. You can't get through college without student loans. I mean, this lie has swept our students and families in the last 20 years. The average college student leaves with 35,000 in debt. Our students owe $1.5 trillion. It's killing college graduates today. Parents, do everything you can to help your kids get through college debt-free. Establishing a saving, as educational savings account while they're little, like one or a 529 plan. But college is they're getting so expensive today, I'm going to guess that most parents can't pull it off without the help of their student. So, teach your kids to hunt down every scholarship they can find. Many scholarships go unclaimed every year. Help them select an affordable school. A state school is going to be more affordable than a private school. It's a lie to think that you have to graduate from a prestigious private school to get a good job. Over half of CEOs and board members of Fortune 500 companies graduated from state schools. Suggest they go two years at community college. If you go two years at Portland Community College and then two years at Oregon, all your resume is going to show is that you graduated from Oregon. Maybe take your senior year at Portland Community College in high school. Shave a whole year off of college. Have your student get a job. Studies show that a student in college who works 20 hours is going to get better grades than a student that doesn't work at all. Here's the point I'm trying to make. The principles we need to teach our children are pretty simple. Work, give, save, spend. That's all there is. Give the first 10th. You know, work hard. Then you get paid. Give the first 10% to God. Starting age three, save up money and pay cash and spare them carefully using a budget. Let me illustrate it with a pie chart. So we have our living expenses, giving, saving, and then O. O, taxes, mortgage. Very few people are going to be able to get a house without a mortgage. Here's the way most people budget. Priority number one, live. Priority number two, O. Priority number three, save. Ah, sorry, no money to save this month. Priority number four, give. Ah, sorry, God. I ran out of money on the 25th. God says you flip it on its head. God's prior number one priority is give. You give back to God the first tenth off the top. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of your, cop, of your crops. Priority number two is save. Every month you spend less than you earn and you put some away. David Ramsey suggests 15% every month. Let it build. Priority number three is O. Your taxes, your mortgage. Priority number four is spend. Now if you've done the others first, you have less to work with and you can make sure you don't forget about giving and saving. Then you can give generously like David did. Third, giving that costs nothing does not lead to God's blessing. David paid full price 
for the threshing floor. And he gave generously to build the temple. And it led to God's blessing. God forgave his sin. He stopped the plague. And he granted him a wise son to succeed him on the throne. The New Testament suggests that when we give generously to God something that costs us something, God will bless us. 2 Corinthians 9 has got to be one of the most amazing scriptures in all the Bible. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God lives a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you'll be able to pay all your other bills. You will abound in every good work. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed. God sees you giving the first 10% back to him. He says, I'm proud of you. I like that. So I'm going to bless you. I'm going to take care of you. You're trusting me with your finances. I will take care. Maybe you'll get a raise. Maybe you'll get a better job. Increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You'll be enriched in every way so you can be generous on every occasion. It's an amazing promise. So here's what we've talked about. God wants us to trust him and give generously to him. It's kind of the big, big point. It brings honor to God. It requires that we be smart with money and it leads to God's blessing. Here's what I want you to do with this. If you're not giving to God, I want to encourage you to start. Give something. If you're giving, I want to urge you to increase your giving to 10% off the top. You could go to our website. We have the tithe challenge. It's basically tithe your income for three months. At the end of three months, if you haven't found that God is helping you to pay your other bills, and you don't have a sense of satisfaction, a good feeling about what you're doing, you can just call the office and we'll give you back your three months giving. That's how strongly I feel about this. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for what you show us through David about giving and managing money so he was able to give. We want to be wise. We don't want to be foolish. So help us in this area. All right, I want you to pray to God. Everybody, head bowed. What did you hear today that maybe convicted you, challenged you? Maybe you want to help your, your kids to learn to work hard and give and save before they spend. Maybe you want to do it yourself. Maybe you want to take the uh, three-month tithe challenge. Whatever, you tell God what you want to do today. You pray.